Well, the word we get, well, part of the word we got this morning is that we're under construction. Hallelujah. And he's Ouch. taking us because how do we know how to get there? He's taking us into a higher spiritual place Hallelujah. and uh, removing the hindrances, <laughs> yep. which include arrogance, fear, flesh, mm -hmm. and all those other nasty things that only he can eliminate. So Amen. we're just blessed for that. Amen. So Father, we just praise your name and we yes, just Lord. thank you and we just invite you, yes. invite you to have your way in this place. Father, we love you. We thank you for the outpouring of the rain that you brought us through. And we know that that is a precursor for the rain that will fall and is falling in this place. Amen. We thank you for the new thing, Father. We just bless your name. And we surrender all we are to all you are. And we thank you, Father, for the uh, network, the, the woven together um, of the people gathered here and all those that stand behind them. We just bless you and we thank you that you brought us together in this place for this time. Hallelujah. May our worship be acceptable unto you. Yes. Jesus. We love you, Lord, yes. in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We know that it will happen. Father, we expect to hear your word and we know that it comes forth. Everyone has a different expectation, whether that's for financial help, marital help, healing, health, whatever it is. If you know such a random piece of information as the number of hairs upon your head, he certainly knows the needs of you and your family. Our petition, Father, is that you would touch each one of us right yes, now as only Jesus. you can and minister to each heart as only you can. Thank you, Lord. Father, you are so good. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. Jesus, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hello, everybody. Hello. And the trip over here was a adventure. I got a power wash. <laughs> My car is cleaner right now than it has been in months. I was able to see out of the windshield when I got here, and I was like, oh my gosh, it's so clean. God has a way of cleaning us up, and he does it through storms sometimes. Amen. Thank you all for the worship. That was awesome. I'm going to pray a minute and then we're going to get started here. Father, we reverence your presence in this place today. We thank you, Lord. Then you go before us, you go behind us, you go to the right, to the left, and then you dwell within us by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. God, we welcome you here to this house today. Lord, come and have your way. May our ears hear what you want us to hear. May our eyes see what you want us to see. And may our hearts respond quickly to the things you're calling us to do. Father, I pray that your word will go forth in power and it will go forth in love. That the people here and those that are watching online, Lord, will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they are loved by God Almighty, King of heaven and earth. And that you are interested in every single one of them. That there is no one left behind. Father, we just thank you and praise you for your word. We praise you for your living word and your living word, Jesus Christ. And we submit ourselves to you in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. This word started... Um, probably about two months ago, while I was studying to do the last message I did over in Stockton called Take No Thought. In the middle of preparing for that message, uh, the Lord told me to 
look at jo uh, Joshua 3, that he had something he wanted to show me. And so I opened my Bible, and I started reading Joshua 3. What I didn't realize until that day when I stood to give that message was that, you know, I just said to the people, I said, Joshua 3 is about when Israel crosses the Jordan. You know, just like a matter of fact that a history teacher would tell you in school. However, when I got through preaching that day, uh, Kurt Arena stood up and he said to the people, do you realize what you just said? And I'm, saying, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what did I say? <laughs> he said, she said Joshua 3, and Israel was preparing to cross the Jordan. He said, where are we today? We're getting ready to cross the Jordan again into our promised land. All the prophetic words for this year is that we are stepping into our promises. We are stepping into the fulfillment of all that God has, has placed on our hearts, and spoken over our lives Hallelujah. Um, into our promised land. Amen. All the prophetic words for this year is that we are stepping into our promises. Amen. We are stepping into the fulfillment of all that God has, has placed on our hearts and spoken over our lives. Hallelujah. So the word I'm bringing today is the same word that Joshua gave to the people before they crossed over the river. And that's where we're at. We're ready to cross over the river, but we need to know how to cross it. So that when we get to the other side, we can reap the blessings that are there. And so that we can do the warfare that will be needed to face the giants. Because they weren't just walking into a, you know, a field of tulips. They had warfare. But some of them were not expected. You know, and they say, well, it's the land of promise, land of milk and honey. Come on over. And then you step in and there's this big, huge giant there ready to eat your lunch. I said, my gosh, we've come to the wrong place. Let's turn around and go back to Egypt, you know? So if you want to open your Bibles to Joshua 3, we're going to read this. This morning when I taught over in uh, Valley Springs, I never got to read the whole chapter because, well, we were two hours late in getting started. But it was all God. I almost didn't have to stand and teach because he had already taught Joshua 3. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from the Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan. He and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they crossed over. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests and the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measures. Do not come near, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. We are crossing over, we are passing into something that none of us have ever seen before. No one on this earth has ever seen before. It has never been recorded ever what God has planned just to cross this river that we're about to cross. Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Then Joshua spoke to the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took the Ark of the Covenant and they went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that I was with Moses, and so I will be with you. You shall command the priests to bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here, and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, By this you shall know that the that the living God is among you. They had just come from Egypt, where there were no living gods. But they're going to see the living God. And Joshua said, He will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perserites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites, and any otherites 
Uh, behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. The ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Today we have the ark of the Lord of all the earth crossing before us across the Jordan. He is crossing before us with his word that we have studied and had available to us for centuries. There is a prophetic word in here for our day and how to walk in what we're walking in right now. He is speaking through the prophets. That's another way that he's bringing forth his word. So we have those things to look at. We can choose to look at them or not. But if we want to get across the Jordan, we better be looking at them. <coughs> Behold, now take, therefore take off, take for yourself twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man from each tribe. And it shall come to pass, as soon as the souls of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off. The waters that came down from the upstream, they shall stand up as a heap. And so it was, when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan, when the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan, and the king of the priests who bore the Ark did it in the edge of the water, where the Jordan overflows all of its banks during this time of harvest. The Jordan was at its fullest state. It couldn't get any fuller. It was just like overflowing its banks. And God was telling the people to cross the river. You better know who's leading you. Amen. If he's asking you to cross a roaring river. <laughs> you better have faith and have a relationship with this person. Or else you're not going to cross. They had some kind of relationship or they wouldn't have gone. that the waters which came down from the upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city beside Zeratan. So the waters that went down to the Sea of Arabah and the Salt Sea failed and were cut off. And the people crossed over opposite Jericho. And the priests who pulled the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all of Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. There was one sentence in that reading that jumped out at me that day, and was, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. That's Joshua 3, 5. A couple of weeks ago, while I was working on this message, uh, one of the ladies in the congregation handed me a book by Bobby Connor that had just finally been released. It was his Shepherd's Rod for 2015. And she said, you need to read this. God told me to give it to you. I've read it, and he's told me to give it to you. So I sat down the next couple of days, and I looked it over. And um, he started sharing the revelations that God had given him on the Day of Atonement last year. And the very first thing he said was, prepare to be awestruck by the presence of Almighty God. Draw near to God and don't delay. It is time to hear clearly and follow his instruction without a moment's hesitation. A God-given revelation is coming that God reigns and is completely in charge. Amen. Tell my people, do not be afraid. God, your Heavenly Father, is in control. Prepare to be awestruck. Then he went on to make the point that sanctification and consecration will be needed. And I thought, well, there, there's that word again, sanctify. And I looked it up, and sanctification and consecration have the same root meaning. They're exactly the same word. You wouldn't think so, but they are. And this is what it looks like in Hebrew. And you read it from right to left. And that first letter on the right is a kuf. And wherever you see that letter, holiness is involved somewhere. And when the rabbis read their scrolls, whenever they see that letter, they know that something's being said about holiness. 
And then that letter in the middle is a dalit. It's like a doorway. And that one that looks like a fire, a, a W on fire, is a shin. And it actually has to do with the fire of God consuming our enemies. And it's the fire of his love that is willing to go to any lengths to set us free. Amen. Amen. So sanctify is a verb meaning to be set apart, to be holy, to show yourself holy, to be treated as holy, to consecrate, to dedicate, to declare as holy, behave or act holy. It's the act of setting apart, drawing someone or something from profane to ordinary use. And when I was sharing in Valley Springs today, they were talking about this wonderful outreach they had here in Modesto over the weekend. And I said, that's what they were doing. They were taking people out of this profane, ugly mess of a life and redeeming them, sanctifying them, putting them in a place where God wants them, reminding them, telling them, maybe for the first time, that God considers them holy. He has sanctified them. He has called them to be his own. And for many of them, I'm sure that that was like the first time in their life they ever felt any value whatsoever. And here's the God of the universe saying, I call you holy. Awesome, awesome God that you The sanctification of the people did not consist of washing their clothes. And a lot of commentary that you read says, well, they went and they washed their clothes and they changed and they got ready to meet with God. Well, have you ever seen three million people going down to the river to wash their clothes? I mean, <laughs> give me a break. Plus, they were like in the, in the desert. So there wasn't a lot of running water other than this river. But it consisted of a spiritual purification, a turning of their hearts to God, in faith, trusting in his promises, and willing to be obedient even though it looked like impossible. Has God ever asked you to do something impossible? <laughs> Most of the things that God asks us to do look impossible. And for us, in our own strength, they are impossible. <laughs> Going on, let's say, he said, um, Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. In other words, pay attention. This is not a small thing. The God of all the earth is going before you. Keep your eyes on him. Amen. And that's the word for today. The God of all the earth is going before us. Let's keep our eyes on him. Thank you, Lord. Everything around us is clamoring for our attention to put us into fear and worry and anxiety. Come on. And we are not giving into that junk. Amen. We are going to keep our eyes on the Lord and on Amen. His Word. In Psalm 51, David says, he asks God, he says, Cleanse my heart, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. That word wash jumped out at me. And so I decided to look it up. And that's what wash looks like. That first letter on the right is a kuf, is it? Kuf, yeah. I'm asking my other Hebrew scholar here. Mm -hmm. The one in the middle, it, again, is a bet, and then that last letter is a sonic. Now, all of you Hebrew students know that. I didn't even need to tell you, right? <laughs> it means, it's a primitive word, and it means trample. The word wash means to trample. By stomping with your feet. It was the job of a fuller. In other words, they put their laundry down in the water and then jumped up and down on it with their feet to get it clean. <laughs> or if you see in these pictures of the women down at the river beating their clothes with a, you know, a stick against a rock. I mean, it's that kind of a thing. So wash wasn't you know, something nice and gentle. Wash was something pretty brutal. Okay, that first letter means to bend down or to surrender. 
Kampf. Bet is divide or division, and it means house or family, or God's dwelling place. And the samak means to lean upon as a prop or an aid or assist or support. And it also stands for the heart of God. So when you put all those letters together, it means to surrender to God's hand as he separates you or divides you out from the world and puts you back in his house, causing you to lean on his heart for support and putting to death all your pride and your conceit and all your, I know how to do this, you don't need to bother me, God. So the next time you ask your kids to go wash, you might want to consider that. <laughs> or if God asks you to go wash, you may want to consider that. There's a scripture out of Malachi that says, Who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. Like I said, the fuller's soap was a trampling to get the clothes clean. There's two examples in scripture that also go along with this. Is out of, uh, Psalm 119, David wrote. This is Psalm 119, 102, 101, and 102. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. I have not departed from your judgments, for you yourself have taught me. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9.27, like an athlete, I punish my body, treating it roughly, training it to do what it should, not what it wants to. Come on. Not what it wants to. Who's in charge? Holy Spirit better be in charge. Otherwise, I fear that after enlisting others for the race, I myself may be declared unfit in order to stand aside. Romans 8, 13 through 15 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. So Joshua said, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. He could have said, you know, sharpen your swords, Shine up your shields and get ready, because we're going into a land of giants. Get ready. But it wasn't military preparation that they needed. They needed a, a heart change. Come on. God was about to reveal himself right in the middle of them, and they were going to meet the God of all the earth. Their parents had met him at Sinai, but they hadn't seen him since. They were ready to meet the God of all the earth. In December of this last year, God told me, he said, this is sort of like counsel to the body, watch my word and I will perform it. It's my turn on center stage. There will be no more guesswork about who I am. I am going to make myself known and manifest for all to see through you and through the body and through sovereign encounters with the supernatural that will be reported on the evening news. God. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. It's good. It would be nice to hear some good news. <laughs> Amen. The prophets are saying that this year will be, be one where many of us will be stepping into our promises. But just like Israel, the fulfillment of their promises was dependent on their obedience. Mm, it was dependent on their obedience, their willingness to align themselves with God's will. They could have decided to go another day. They could have, you know, well, he says go tomorrow. Why wait? Let's just go now. Some of us, you know, run ahead of God and I wonder why it doesn't work. It just doesn't. <laughs> Some of God's promises are unconditional and all we have to do is believe them. Just like, you know, Jesus is going to be born in Bethlehem. That's, that was a given. That was going to happen no matter what. However, there's other promises that require us to meet certain conditions. In meeting those conditions, we're not learning God's blessing, but we're preparing our hearts to receive God's blessing. So let's look at the word sanctified again. In Numbers 3.13, God said something that sounds really strange to us. 
He says, on the day that I struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified to myself all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast. They shall be mine. I am the Lord. Notice that he says, you know, I'm sanctifying all the firstborn. A lot of them had not even been born yet. They had done absolutely nothing to earn sanctification. They hadn't done anything to be marked as holy. God just says, these are holy. These are mine. In Jeremiah 1.5, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, and I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. And yet here God tells Joshua to have the people sanctify themselves. So in one case, God's sanctifying us before we're even born. We don't have to do anything. And then the next breath, he's telling Joshua to sanct them to sanctify themselves. If you look through the Old Testament, you'll see many things that God sanctified. He sanctified the tabernacle. He sanctified every piece that was put in the tabernacle. He sanctified the priests. He sanctified, you know, Israel. He called all of those things his. These, I'm setting these apart as holy to me. In the New Testament, Jesus sanctified us by going to the cross. Amen. And when we received him as Savior, when we asked him to be Lord and Savior of our lives, then we got the sanctified stamp on our life. But God did something more. He sent his Holy Spirit to help us walk out that sanctification. There's more to sanctification than just having a stamp. In Philippians 2, 12 through 16, it says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He's speaking to people that are saved. And then he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, it just doesn't, it sounds like it doesn't compute. One minute he's saying you're saved, and the next one he's saying you've got to work it out. Well, God gives us the will and the ability to do his will, but we still have to choose to follow. He can't, you know, he chose not to make us robots. And I'm so glad. Because mm -hmm. it'd, be, it'd be pretty boring, actually. Edna was teaching at Angel's Camp the other night, and it was an awesome teaching. It was wonderful proven that it takes 21 days of mental exercise, seven minutes a day, for you to change a mindset. But however, it takes 63 days, or three sets of 21 days, to completely eradicate the old mindset and create a brand new. When you have negative thoughts, or vows, you know, inner vows that we make, it literally grows a tree in your brain of blackness. And when you have good thoughts, then it grows a healthy tree in your brain. Well, it takes a while to take the one down and put the other one up. It takes persistence. It takes work. And so much of the grace message is, you know, you're saved. Isn't that wonderful? We're all going to heaven. There's no work involved. But there is work involved. We're to work with the Holy Spirit. That's why God put him here, man, to help us. If we didn't need help, why would he be here? Right. Let's look at it this way. A boss gives you a new position. Say you've been, you know, you've been handing out mail for forever and you're just tired of this job, and so he says, you know, you've shown some skill. I think I'm going to put you as a secretary in this office. I'm going to teach you how to do bookkeeping, and you'll be in charge of the payroll. You think, wow, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I get a raise. I get a position. I may even get an office. You know? However, you don't know anything about payroll. You don't know anything about anything, except for handing out mail. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what happens? He takes a person as an assistant and he puts them alongside you. They have done the job before. They know how to do it. They know the ins and outs of how the boss works. 
This is how you need to do it. And then you go to a time of training. Now all that time, you still have that label over you, secretary over payroll. You are a secretary of payroll, but you don't know how to do it, but you're learning. That's what God does. He says, sanctify it. And he sends Holy Spirit. Let's walk out sanctification together. Let me show you how to do it. I'll show you what the boss likes, and it'll all be good. Yeah. That's what it's about. Praise the Lord. Jesus asked the Father in John 17, 17 and 19, he said, sanctify them by your truth, Father. Yes, truth. Your word is truth. Jesus. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Jesus followed the word so he would be sanctified. Come on. So we would have an example to follow. He is the truth. Amen. He is the word. If you need something to follow, follow Jesus. I think that's a really good idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, not, it's not my first thought of the day. But, you know, that is a good idea. The other thing is, is that you know, religion will teach you that you have to somehow earn this and make it happen all by yourself. But sanctification is God's effort to sift you. Your role in the process is to let him do it. Have you ever seen them thresh grain? Where they take this grain in a, a flat basket kind of thing and they throw it up in the air and the chaff blows away and they throw it up in the air and the chaff blows away. That's sort of what sanctification is about. Jesus gave me this wonderful vision a couple weeks ago when I was praying about all this. He showed me this vision. He's rides up in a Jeep. Now, God knows I had some fun times sometimes. He rode up in this Jeep. It was an all-open Jeep. We were out in this flat, you know, sort of dry grass plain kind of place. And he said, jump in. He said, I want to take you for a ride. So at first, it was a lot of fun, you know. But we were going fast. We were bouncing over all this stuff. And I asked him, I said, where are we going? And he said, the Serengeti. And I said, well, why are we here? And he said, to see the animals. You know, I've never really wanted to go to Serengeti, but hey. You know. And so I said, help me to see what I'm supposed to see. I don't know what I'm looking for. Now. Next thing I know, we see this mother lioness in her cub. And she's licking him clean or trying to. The cub keeps, you know, you know, turning away. You ever try to wash a toddler's face? You know, they don't like it. Well, she, the little cub did not like it too much either. But finally, he just gave up. All right, Mama, just let me clean, and I'll, I'll sit here. And pretty soon, he was kind of enjoying it, almost asleep, you know. He was just re resting. So I asked the Lord, I said, is that it? Are you wanting me to see that the cleaning process isn't a guilt trip, but a renewal? Have you ever thought about that? Cleansing is a punishment. It's not punishment. It's a renewal. It's rebirth. Cleansing draws us closer to Him. Yes. To the place where we look forward to it rather than running from it. He said, My ways are not your ways, beloved. Fear not, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And the kingdom often comes through cleansing. Amen? Amen. 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 <clears throat> We've all been there. So do you want to begin living who you already are? One that is set apart for God? Do you want to experience sanctification? Well, get ready to be tossed up in the air, to be stripped, <laughs> to be crushed, and to yeah. be washed. And you need to learn to cooperate with the process. It will go a lot quicker and a lot smoother. And you're talking, to, you know, talking from experience. Mm -hmm. And don't let the enemy beat you up about it. Because that's one of the biggest hindrances to cleansing is the enemy comes in and puts a major guilt trip on you. You know, you're just worthless. You know, God just punishing you. You've just blown it. You're never going to be anything. And you just give in to it. And it's really hard to get out of that one. Sanctification is not about becoming perfect. It's about becoming perfectly His. Amen. 
It's about giving more and more of our lives over to God as his possession. The only kind of truth that sets us free is the truth that we obey. That's right. It can't just be up here. You know, you hear a wonderful message on Sunday morning, but if you don't put feet to it, it's not really truth for you. Yeah. It only becomes truth when you put feet to it. It only gets written on your heart when you put feet to it. We talk about God writing his word on our heart. Well, he writes it there because we're walking it out. Not because we're just sitting there thinking about it. Amen. To be sanctified in truth means to be completely obedient and dependent on God, what he's, whatever he says, period. So if you want to be sanctified, the very first thing to do is decide to obey him 100%. Oh, amen. And anything that varies from that, no, we're going back. What did God tell me? You know, what was the last thing God told you to do? Get him a cannon. You know? <laughs> well, it's the same thing. You know, that has happened so many times in my life. Where I'm down the road, I'm in a mess, and I don't know what's going on. What was the last thing I told you to do? Yeah. I hadn't done it. Yeah. I went back and did it, and my goodness, the road got a lot smoother. Sanctification is about placing our entire lives in his hands. It's about our behavior, not about what we believe. It means that we accept his word as the only measure for our actions. To be sanctified is to live according to the book, all of it. Because this is not only a written word, this is God's character here. This is who he is. If we're going to follow him, then we need to live by this. Well, I've been meditating on sanctification now for almost two months. I've been repeating these scriptures over in my mind. I have like 40 pages of scriptures, so you glad I didn't choose to bring all those today. <laughs> and I've been asking God questions and listening for answers and studying all along. Listening to the news, listening to prophets. You know, everything I pick up, where is sanctification, God? Where is it? Then the other night I got ready for bed and the Holy Spirit said to me, it's all fulfilled in two laws. That's all he said. It's all fulfilled in two laws. And I knew immediately what he was talking about. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. He told me then to look at 1 Corinthians 13 out of the Living Bible. And he said, this is sanctification. This is what sanctification looks like. Now well, I'm going to read these verses of verses 4 through 7. in are chapter 13 and 1 Corinthians. And keep in mind that as I read these verses, that this, is, this describes how Jesus lived. And this is how God, God treats us. This is how Jesus feels towards us. He lived the sanctified life. It says, love is very patient and kind. Never jealous or envious. Never boastful or proud. Never haughty or selfish or rude. Love does not demand its own way. It is not irritable or touchy. Anybody feeling sort of like a little nudge here in there? Amen. <laughs> yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. It does not hold grudges right. and will hardly ever notice when others do it wrong. You know, I have this, you know, Martin stood up today and he was talking about having an administrator's mind where everything's got to be lined up and, you know, we've got to meet the schedule and everything's got to be in place. I have it on the same way. However, God's changing both of us. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but when you're in that place of administration, you notice when others do it wrong. It's been one of the hardest things for me to overcome. To see people in God's eyes as being people of love and grace and they're gifted in one way and I'm gifted in another way and they may do it a different way but it doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. You know? 
It is never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. If you love someone, you will be loyal to him no matter what the cost. You will always believe in him, always expect the best of him, and always stand your ground in defending him. Amen. This is sanctification. It's a life motivated by love. Then he told me to look in Colossians 3. And Colossians 3 is one of my, another good, wonderful chapter I love. But he told me to look in the Message Bible. So I dug it out, because I don't normally look at the Message Bible, but that's what he said, so. So if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. That's what it says. Yeah. Pursue the things which Christ presides. He see things from his perspective. Your old life is dead, you know. Your new life, which is your real life, even though invisible to spectators, is with Christ in God. He is your life. When Christ shows up again on this earth, you'll show up too, the real you the glorious you. Meanwhile, be content with obscurity, like Christ. And that means killing off everything connected with that way of death. Sexual promiscuity, impurity, lust, doing whatever you feel like doing whenever you feel like doing it. Oh my goodness. Have your own way, you know. It's all about me. No, it's not. Grab whatever attracts you. That's a life shaped by things and feelings instead of by God. And it's because of this kind of thing that God is about to explode in anger on disobedient sons. It wasn't long that you long ago that you were doing all of that stuff and not knowing any better. But you know better, you know better now, so make sure it's all gone for good. Your bad temper, your irritability, your meanness, your profanity, your dirty talk. Amen. Don't lie to one another. You're done with that old life. Mm -hmm. It's like a filthy set of ill-fitting clothes you stripped off and put in a fire. Mm -hmm. Now you're dressed in a new wardrobe. Every item of your new way of life is custom made by the Creator with His label on it. All the old fashions are now obsolete. Words like Jewish and non-Jewish, religious and irreligious, insider, outsider, uncivilized and uncouth, slave, free. They don't mean anything. From now on, everyone is defined by Christ. Everyone is included in Him. So, chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline. How about being even-tempered? content, and taking second place, quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the Master forgave you. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic all-purpose garment. Never leave home without it. Now that is, again, a life of sanctification. In Philippians 2, 5-9, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance of men, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Are we demonstrating a life of sanctification in our everyday lives? Do we meet the criteria? Are we living a life of humility and obedience? When we don't, do we repent? Or do we say, oh, that's just me? Repentance is more than feeling sorry that we got caught. You know, if you don't get caught, maybe you don't need to repent. <laughs> it's an awareness that we have been kicking against God himself when we sin we are sinning against God Almighty we are sinning against his word we are defaming the Lord Jesus Christ we are walking on the blood that he poured out for us at that cross 
Yes, we are sanctified. We are set apart to be his sons and daughters. We are set apart to be kings and priests. We are set apart, apart to be his spotless bride. But in all these things, we are to look like him. Paul wrote, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Sanctification is a great big word, but it's part of who God created us to be. He sanctified us and he set us apart as holy. Not perfect, but perfectly his. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. That's the song that used to be sung so many years ago. And the word says that even creation groans for the revealing of the sons of God. Well, the love that, they're lo that the world is looking for is not the romantic, sappy kind of love of roses and chocolates that we're going to have on Valentine's Day. <laughs> it's tough love. It's a love that sacrifices. It's a love that confronts. It's a love that encourages and heals. Amen. It's a love that sets healthy boundaries. Right. It's a love that pulls people out of their ditch and helps them to walk again. It's a love that points out the good things in their life and encourages them That's to be right. all that God created them to be. Hallelujah. It's a love that exposes the enemy and brings deliverance so people can fulfill their destiny. That's, right. That's what real love looks like. That's, right. That's the kind of love the, the world is looking for. And we have it. He's living right here. In Hebrews 12, it says that God is a consuming fire. And starting with verse 25, it says, See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of the things that are made, that the things that, which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. We are walking into God's divine kingdom manifest on this earth which cannot be shaken. Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Amen. Now we sing songs about the refiner's fire, we call out for God to send his fire, but we, do we have any idea of what we're really asking him for? <laughs> yeah. The fire of God comes to cleanse and to purify us, not just to warm our toes. That's right. Amen. It's coming to make us holy. At Passover, the Jewish fathers gather up their children, they light a candle, and they go from room to room in the house, searching in the corners and in the cupboards and in the closets, looking for leaven, any kind of crumbs of bread or crackers or that kind of stuff. And the kids get so excited when they find some leaven, because then, you know, it's like a, a big search treasure hunt. And they put them in a bag, these pieces of leaven, they take them out to a central fireplace in the town, and on a certain time, everybody in the town gathers around this fireplace, where everybody throws in their bags, and they burn up the leaven. The leaven represents sin. They are removing the sin from their house so that they can say, our house is sanctified for Passover. Is your house sanctified for Passover? Is your house sanctified for Passover? Amen. Passover's coming. Hallelujah. As believers, the Holy Spirit brings his fire, and he's the one that searches our hearts. Others may see our sin very clearly. We can see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We can see other people's sin really well. And unfortunately, I've discovered that the things that we see in others usually will find a place in us somewhere. We're familiar with it, so it looks really, you know, that, look at that. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look a little deeper, Mary Ellen, you might find that there might be a little <laughs> bit in there somewhere. Yeah. Okay? In Psalm 19, it says, this is the first 12 through 14, who can understand his errors? 
Cleanse me from my secret faults and keep back your servant from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. In order to live a sanctified life, we need daily checkups for the Holy Spirit. We need to ask him to search our hearts and let him show us and lead us back to truth. Truth sanctifies us and sets us apart for God's purpose. Truth is a person, like we said. His name is Jesus. Truth is just not a head full of knowledge. And that's what the Greek thinking thought for years. I mean, the Western thinking, you know, I've got all truth right here. But don't look at my life. That's, you know, that's my life and you don't touch it. But I've got truth. No. The truth is Jesus Christ and his word. Sanctification is a process. Someone else can come up and pray for you. They can bind and cast off a spirit of fear or lust or insecurity or lethargy or poverty or whatever it may be. And you may feel wonderful for 10 minutes or a half hour or maybe even a week. But we have to make daily choices not to let that thing back in. Come on. And the only way to do it is to discipline ourselves away from the, whatever that was. Sanctification is a co-laboring with Holy Spirit. It requires confession, repentance, receiving God's forgiveness, and then walking in the truth. He's coming back for a spotless bride. In 2 Corinthians 7, 1, it says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let us cleanse ourselves with Holy Spirit's help. There are many prophetic words over this year, and yet sanctification is a core that runs through most of them. Cindy Jacobs calls this year a turnaround year. He said God will give his people a chance to correct their lives mid-course, modify, amend, change, transform, or renovate. Repentance in Hebrew is teshuva, and it means to turn. So if this is a turnaround year, could it also be a possible year of repentance? I think so. Amen. Yeah. I think so. Now normally we run from the word repentance. We don't like it, but it's just like getting your face washed. If so, God can love you even more. You will know his love. You can get even closer to him. Many are saying that this is the double door year, you know, double portion, double promises, everything fulfilled. Yet those promises are only coming to those who have made God's word their standard. Those who are united in love and moving in compassion. He's not going to give us all those promises if we're still out there living like hellions and rebellious people. There is a storm coming, and it will wreak havoc on this nation and in different places of this world. And there will be suffering. But its purpose is not to kill us. Its purpose is to reveal our foundation. God is asking, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you do not do what I say? You know, we can sit in these meetings every week and be you know, religious on every Tuesday night or Wednesday night or whatever, we can read our Bibles, we can pray, we can do all that. But if we're not living it, it's all filthy rags. Amen. It's all filthy rags. Amen. He may be asking you, why are you holding on to unforgiveness? Why are you trying to exalt yourself to gain position? Why are you living with someone who you aren't married to? Or having sexual relations outside of marriage? Why are you cheating on your taxes or slandering other believers? Why are you abusing your body with drugs or alcohol or food when it's my temple? Etc., etc., etc. The list is endless. If you're doing any of these things, your foundation is faulty. The only foundation that, we will, that will withstand in the coming storm is the foundation of love. In John 14, verse 21 through 26, Jesus explains what love looks like. He who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. 
and I will love him and manifest myself to him. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but my Father who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance that I have said to you. He's our teacher. He's our one to train us. He's the one to assist us in this process. We're not without assistance. On July the 24th in 2012, the Lord said to me, he said, this is the word for my body. Walk before me and be blameless. My ways are right. My ways are just. My ways will set you free and enable you to lead others to freedom. My ways don't look logical. My ways don't look logical. Have you ever heard from God and you say, well, that, that's stupid. <laughs> Surely, you know, that can't be God. <laughs> That doesn't make any sense at all. No, 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 I didn't hear from God. My ways do not look logical. They do not mirror the world system for success. Humble yourself beneath my hand and I will lift you up. Fear not, there is no fear in love, none. Rest in my love and seek my face. Did I not tell you that I would send another comforter? Lean on him, walk in obedience to his direction, and you will ascend to the hill of the Lord with clean hands and a pure heart. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God has sanctified us. But we still have the choice. May each of us sanctify ourselves by his spirit and be ready to join him in the greatest move of God that this world has ever seen. It's time for us to be about our Father's business. Amen. And not our own. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm just going to offer a short prayer here. Heavenly Father, even today, Lord, these words. Yeah, you want to share that? I'm telling you, Margo is being used uh, prophetically through song. Yeah, yeah she's blessing people. Yeah, and it's, yes, it's, she is. It's spreading into the glow and we're set. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to share that <clears throat> Lita invited me to go. Um, I've gone with her twice now. Um, but like yesterday was really special. Um, we went into a glow where there's a lot of ladies that have come out of the prisons and a lot of difficult situations. And it was just such, it was just such a presence of the Lord. Um, the minute I started to worship, um, the Lord had told me the song just to play quietly in the background and I mean just the Holy Spirit came in and Lita was on fire um, she was breaking stuff off of all of us and ministering to the ladies and just to, to see the tears of joy just to hear the testimonies of the ladies uh, as they were being ministered to was just such a blessing I mean I don't know if there's anyone else here that the Lord's calling you, but I want to encourage you that if someone asks you to go with them to, to step out with your gifting and share, because it was a real blessing to me to be able to be part of that and um, to watch someone else ministering who was ministering in such a dynamic and really powerful way. It was beautiful. Hallelujah.